And that's all we were doing with surgery was adding some years back on people's lives, weren't we? I mean, coronary bypass is my surgery I did, I invented. That probably added 15 to 20 years on a person's life, right? Well, I'm able to do that right here without ever going to the operating room. And uh, so we think this is probably the most important part is to keep them off the operating room table. And even the patient you operated, say you did a coronary bypass on, you couldn't change his habits because you didn't have him long enough. He was in the hospital a week, and then he would come see you once or twice, and then he'd see his cardiologist after that. But nobody had control over saying, you gotta change these habits, you gotta change the way you eat. Hey folks, it's Mike Meltzer here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are live with Dr. Mark DiDominico and Connie Gutterson, the authors of The Love Diet. Today we're going to talk about some highlights and pearls that you can benefit from this amazing book, which I recently read the last couple of days. So Dr. Mark, Connie, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. What's nice is the way that we work with patients in that situation to break the guilt cycle is to really understand what's happening with emotional eating and truly understanding so when you recognize it you have the tools to say okay I understand what's happening it's not my fault I understand they don't have to understand it to the degree as we're speaking as sophisticated language of brain chemistry but to say there's a part of my brain that reacts this way and how to recognize when this is happening and have the right tools to get over it and so it's one thing to recognize that this occurs because you know, you're eating in response to guilt or emotional stress, but how do you get over it and how do you overcome and recognize it? So, how about eating because nobody loves me? Yeah. Oh, That's yes. probably really common. Mm -hmm. I'm eating because nobody loves me. Yeah. And can you think, you know, especially in people is in, that isolate themselves, which really smart people tend to do, they tend to isolate. If you go to Microsoft, everybody's in a cubicle. Mm. They come into That's this building right. and they're kind of grouchy at first, but then they realize it's okay to be a person, but they're isolated, isolated, mm -hmm. isolated. One of the first patients I ever had in this program, when you walked up to her on the treadmill, said, how are you doing today? She started crying. In the first week, we know they have a hard time getting their arms around this program, yeah. you know, because suddenly within three or four days, they're not hungry and they're having trouble eating just what you told me, 1,200 or 1,500 calories, that's okay. And uh, so they'll kind of laugh about that, but they're having trouble getting their mm -hmm. arms totally around the program. So we have, we have them with a psychologist every week for the first six weeks. And they're in group therapy 10 times during the total program. Now, we don't call it group therapy, we call it workshops. Okay, because uh, a tech person understands a workshop a lot easier than he understands. Group therapy goes, not me. <laughs> Psychologist, not me. Lifestyle coach, yeah, okay. Lifestyle counselor, okay. But no, not getting in this head of mine because I'm having trouble in my head myself, yeah. <laughs> right? I don't want you to know all my sins and all my stuff, right? right. So it's kind of like waking up or, or being sitting in the dark someplace and you flash back and go, oh, did I do that? That's Ever exactly do that one? a good description. Michael, you old enough to do that? Yeah. I yeah. do yeah. that. I see oh my God, I did that when I was 15 or something. Oh, geez, I got, yeah. I got caught by her parents <laughs> necking with her in the, right. right. Oh man, and, and I got all embarrassed at the time and I'm all embarrassed again and I'm 70 years old, right? But, and so when we can finally wiggle back to that, then we can begin to figure out. We don't have enough, you don't have enough time to do psychoanalysis. That takes five years of the patient to really get back and find out what's really back in the base of that brain. The other interesting thing you gotta remember is habits are here, thinking's there. Habits are automatic, thinking is not so automatic. We gotta get this to overwrite the bad habits. Like eight o'clock at night, you get up and you, from your and you walk out to your kitchen and you're looking in the drawers. That's a habit. You say if you say to yourself, "Am I hungry?" Yourself will say, "No." Well, what am I standing in front of this drawer with open and looking for this food for? Well, it would really, it would taste good to me and make me feel good right now because it's probably reward center food, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a habit to get up 
you you have to get this thing to kick in and say I don't want to do that. And after you stop doing that for like two weeks, it'll get easier and easier not to do. But the first couple of weeks is pretty dramatic. But by changing their diet the way we do the first week, then they are not hungry at all. They don't even think about going out to that cabinet because that's not there's nothing in that cabinet that's on their diet. Mm -hmm. In fact, we tell them to get all that stuff out of their house. Now, funny story. So I'll uh, give the introductory seminar down here. It's two and a half hours, right? And they get an idea of what's going to go on. They can decide whether they want to do the program or not. And I'll say, you all have these foods in your kitchen, don't you? And they'll all go like you're doing. Yeah, I do. I say, are you going home and get rid of them? Raise your hand if you're going to. Nobody in, uh, in 24 years has ever raised their hand. Mm. One guy finally went like this. I said, well, are you going to get rid of them? He said, no, but I'll go home and eat it. Then it'll be gone. <laughs> right. See, I mean, it, it's there's such, a, there's such a, a tight thing there that, I mean, it's hard to break, isn't it? Because right. if I told you to go home and get rid of what's in your kitchen tonight, you're going to think, well, I, I might, but probably not. Yeah. Well, you do prove of what I have in my kitchen, but I understand the concept mm -hmm. of what's going on. But So this connection that people have uh, with food is also chemical as well, like we kind of talked about. It's not only just the emotional aspect, like reward-based eating, but then the, the chemicals. So that's why it's really important just to harp and kind of summarize this concept to get rid of this toxic food because it creates this vicious cycle. Is that kind of what we're saying? Yeah, remember, if you get too much sugar, you want more sugar. Mm -hmm. And carbohydrates is a nice name for for what? Sugar. 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 Okay. So if I get too much carbohydrate, uh, I get too much. Now, when, when I was a kid, the bread section in the store was this big. Brown bread, white bread. Now how big is the bakery section? Yeah. Forever. Right. Exactly. And what's it made from? Refined flour, which is? Sugar. going to turn into sugar in my mouth, isn't it? So if I keep pushing that stuff in, then the sugar sets, my, I get my whole system gets out of whack and I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. Mm -hmm. And we got to break that cycle. And then you, you have to be careful you don't fall back into it again, okay? That's, that's the fall down point when people get their weight off. Remember that your body thinks that you should weigh what you weigh right now. Okay, if you weighed 250 pounds, that's your set point. So now you take off and you go down to 180, which would be your right weight, your body still thinks you should be 250. So when you consume too many calories, it'll suck them back up and try to take you back to the 250. Will your set point reset? Yeah, we think so, anywhere from six months to a couple of years. Mm. Okay. Now once it resets, then it'll set for 180. See, it doesn't, when it doesn't know you wanted to go from 250 to 180 because you wanted it for your health, it thinks you've got an area where there's no food. So if an animal gets in an area where there's no food, what happens? He stops doing everything, doesn't he? He lays down, and he waits, and, you know, he will eventually, and when he does finally get some food, he will put all that weight back on, and he'll come back to that same set point. So there's a lot of stuff going on in, you know, in the physiology of the body that you've got, that they've got to understand as they go through the program. I think our patients respond really well to the type of diet we've created that focuses on decreasing the amount of sugars in processed foods or added sugars, even as simple as grains and starchy vegetables. Um, it seems that that's a key characteristic of 2020 Lifestyles Diet because so many of our patients are pre-diabetic, very sensitive to carbohydrate, especially the starchy one, and of course sugars. And, and, and I know you appreciate this fact with your background, but we, we find that the moment they really stop to eliminate these cravings for sweets and stop the sugar intake and the grains and the starchy carbohydrates and snack foods, they do really well. But um, The hunger goes away. The hunger goes away. Their energy levels go up. Their blood sugar levels are much better. Well, we know that if, if you will eat three meals a day and two snacks a day, you will actually raise the metabolism of your body without mm -hmm. ever getting out of that chair. Wow, that's a deal. Okay, if you will get 10 hours of sleep at night and not eat, or eight hours, of, let, let me say, get your seven or eight hours mm -hmm. of sleep, but you go 10 hours without eating, raise your metabolism some, some, some more. There's a little guy on the, there's a, there's a product on the, on the cells, I call them the PPARs, that are like, they, they run the register to up or down to metabolism. 
So those things will all help you if you once you get into that, keep eating the right foods at the right times and you will feel full and yet your metabolism goes up. And then you know because you've written about bacteria, if we don't control the bacteria of the bowel, we can absorb 140 to 180 additional calories mm -hmm. from the bacteria per day. That's 15 pounds in a year too. Yeah. So a lot of people, 15 pounds a year is all that they're overweight. And the, you know, 10 years goes by and they're overweight 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. And it may be that they got the bowel bacteria all out of balance. And that comes from things like artificial uh, sweeteners, probably killing bacteria. All, you look in the back of these processed foods, can you tell me what those chemicals do? Oh my Some of them have got to be killing the good bacteria and leaving yeah. the bad bacteria. Right. And remember, in, just in the large colon, there's 100 trillion, and there's only 37 trillion cells in your whole body. There's 100 trillion of these guys living there. And if you knock off too many of the good ones, then suddenly the bad ones are, are doing bad things to you. They're giving you too much, because they're digesting the food that's in there. They're kicking it back and the cells are absorbing it in the colon and it's getting absorbed in the body and you can gain 15 pounds a year just from them being out of whack. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. So there's a lot of things that go into this whole thing that we, you know, and we're still working to, to answers to all of them. Um, if you were to ask me, does a probiotic work? I have the faintest idea because we don't know what the real balance in there is yet. Uh, they're hard to study because they're anaerobic, which means they will not grow in air. Therefore, when you take them out, you better take them out and put them in non-air. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a hundred trillion, and there's probably 400 species of bacteria. Wow, I mean, this is, it'll take 10 or 15 years, but it's the new field that's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along those lines, interestingly, there was a meta-analysis that looked at all the probiotic research in type 2 diabetes, and actually Dr. Mark did show a reduction in triglycerides and insulin recently. So this was oh, that's great. over 500 subjects. But the question is, which is the right bacteria to give them yeah, at that it's time? So confusing as See, I don't know which is the right bacteria no, to give them. We use probiotics here, don't get me yeah. wrong. Sure, sure. Okay, but what's the right, exact right balance oh, sure. to do? And that's coming. It will, someday we'll know that, but we don't know it yet. Yeah. Uh, even for the consumer, as they're standing there at the grocery store, they really are overwhelmed with all the variety and the choices. And but it's it's a, an exciting new field, and um, you know I, I think it's wonderful. It's just that, as Mark said, we just don't know enough. Sure. You know about what is that magic combination? We got we got some areas we we've, we've got to do some work in, but in the meantime, we know that if we get enough water into them, the first. They get up to 64 ounces of water a day. They're washing out some of this bad, I call them endotoxins that are coming off of these bacteria, okay? We're washing that out of the bowel. Uh, we do know that certain fibers help the good bacteria to grow. So, you, you know, you want to get them into some fiber. The more fiber, the better. And we think that just getting the, the diet back to what we think it should be, which is, is balancing up the, these bacteria in the colon. The bacteria get totally out of wrap when they're getting all this carbohydrate, all Sugars. these artificial flavors, all these these chemicals that I don't even know the names of. Mm -hmm. I, I turn a, even a pop bottle around and look <laughs> at the chemicals on it. I don't understand what the heck they do. And so yeah. processed foods have all these things, and we don't know what they're doing to these bacteria, but I don't think it's making them real happy. Mm -hmm. And then remember that the bacteria come from mom and dad and the family, right? That's where they came from. So if we have obesity in the family, are we transporting it through this way? Or if we have diabetes in the family, are the bacteria responsible for all of it, or part of it, or what are they responsible for? Um, we see depression in certain families and anxiety. I think the anxiety part comes from the bacteria too. but. You've looked at this too, so I know that you know that you know that there's so many things to do. Um, by the way, uh, we used to run insulin levels here on every patient coming in. They were all elevated, which meant that they're insulin resistant. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the time we were finished with the program, there were no elevated insulins, so I quit doing them because it was expensive to do them, and I, I knew I was going to break their insulin resistance with the exercise and the diet change, and that's also. When the insulin resistance gets up, throws a whole new thing oh, in there yeah. about what makes you hungry. Because mm -hmm. insulin can make you hungry too. Right. 
goes to the brain cells, starts talking to them. They say, oh, I got some insulin. I need a little sugar. Send me up some sugar. Because remember, brain cells only function on sugar. They do not function yeah. on the fats at all. Dr. Mark, I love what you're, you've been doing for the last 30 plus years and 11,000 plus people have gone through this program. And what's interesting is new research. Years. Oh, sorry, 24 years. Well, you know, I'm, I started at, uh, at the Hope at, in Seattle as a cardiovascular surgeon, okay? And we started what's called the Hope Heart Institute. And, um, and we were the first heart surgeons in Seattle, Esther Savage and I. And at one night we sat down and we'd written 140 some papers and we looked at all the papers and said, every paper has to do with what's happened to the patient now on the, t so he's on the table. Now do this to him when you operate him. And we said, we gotta stop these patients from getting on the operating room table. So that was why we came over here initially. And that was really to work on high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. We thought if we could reverse those diseases, we could really save these patients from ever ending in the operating room. Well, we found out after about five years we could reverse them. We could put them, they would be, in other words, we get our diabetics totally off their medications 75% of the time, about 73% of the time. We get our, our hypertensives off all their medications, normal blood pressure 79% of the time. High cl cholesterol is a little bit of a problem because you have a genetic cholesterol called familiar hyperlipidemia. Um, but we still are able to get most of 61% of them off all their medications. So they're normal. I mean, quote, normal, but they can always become that if they get overweight again if they, or if they don't take care of themselves again. And so we got through that and then we realized we were going to have to deal with this weight problem. So we spent the next 10 years working with the weight. Now we've got guys in this program that are almost 600 pounds. They'll be all right in the end. Okay? All right. They'll be all right. Um, we won't get them to 180, but we might get them to 250, 280, and uh, the taller they are, the better I am, the happier <laughs> I am about it. <laughs> okay, right. but I mean, we're going to get them down, and we're going to save their, and we're going to save their life. We're going to add 10 or 15 good quality years on their life, and that's all we were doing with surgery was adding some years back on people's lives, weren't we? I mean, coronary bypass is my surgery. I did. I invented, that probably added 15 to 20 years on a person's life, right? Well, I'm able to do that right here without ever going to the operating room. And uh, so we think this is probably the most important part is to keep them off the operating room table. And even the patient you operated, say you did a coronary bypass on, you couldn't change his habits because you didn't have him long enough. He was in the hospital a week and then he would come see you once or twice, and then he'd see his cardiologist after that. But nobody had control over saying, you gotta change these habits, you gotta change the way you eat. And that's all we were doing with surgery was adding some years back on people's lives, weren't we? I mean, coronary bypass is my surgery I did, I invented. That probably added 15 to 20 years on a person's life, right? Well, I'm able to do that right here without ever going to the operating room. And uh, so we, we think this is probably the most important part is to keep them off the operating room table and able to handle themselves. Even the patient you operated, say you did a coronary bypass on, you couldn't change his habits because you didn't have him long enough. He was in the hospital a week and then he would come see you once or twice and then he'd see his cardiologist after that. But nobody had control over saying, you gotta change these habits, you gotta change the way you eat, you gotta change. We told them that. The dietician walked into the room and said to them, Michael, now you've had these coronary bypasses, you need to change your diet. And Michael would go, oh, okay. And normally the dietician weighed 290 pounds, so that didn't work very well. Right. <coughs> so. We, this was the first place where we really could focus on the patient, and, and they would start to focus on what they were thinking, too. And it's really ahead of its time. I mean, just now, oh. 2016, we're seeing medical publications like JAMA and the Journal of Obesity. I have a paper here that is in line with what you've been doing for, mm -hmm. for two decades, and I think that's pretty remarkable. So was it just intuition that led you to realize that we need to synthesize you know, the, the mind-body connection and work with psychologists and personal trainers? like? How did, what aha moment, or did it just come together organically over time? Well, I knew we had to change what was going on in their head. Uh, and we knew we had, uh, and we figured out right away that nobody loved themselves that was coming to see us. Uh, they, they were reaching out for help, and I, one of my best friends was a, was a psychologist. Uh, Dr. Waborski is a, 
uh, psychologist. So he came and helped us with our beta studies, and we, we just started this way from the very first beta. Now, we refined it as we went. We learned as we went, but uh, we knew we had to get we had to get this habit thing changed. Otherwise, they were going to go back to their old habits. And if they go back to their old habits, they're getting their way back. Mm -hmm. So we had to say, you don't just change your diet for the time you want to lose your weight. You got to, this is the rest of your life, which is hard to say. I mean, if I told you to change something that you like to do every day for the rest of your life, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard yeah. for you. And I think what really sets Dr. Mark's program apart is that there's a, a you know there's medical knowledge that we can all appreciate through journals and you know seminars that you go to but there's also a type of wisdom that comes with working with patients for many many years and when you have a clinic like 2020 lifestyles that's been in practice for over 20 years and over 11,000 patients you start to learn things that are not captured in a journal and it's this wisdom of experience that allows you today to do a book like this because many people will say, well, how did you come up with this approach? It's so interesting. Well, there's really few people that can write a book like The Love Diet because there's so many years of experience, not only medically, professionally, but also intuitively from working with so many patients and you gain this wisdom. So it's, a, it's really unique. Absolutely. So in this room, every once a week, there will be five docs, 10 psychologists, 10 or 12 dietitians, and four exercise physiologists. And on this screen behind us, a dietitian will present every patient in this program. Mm -hmm. And we will talk about what, the, and we have a, a dashboard of, of information there that we can see everything they've done, the whole program, that week, and so forth and so on if they've had their cholesterol checked or whatever, it all shows up there. And if they're not losing weight, we stop the whole meeting down and say, oh, how do we help this person get back on track again? And from that, we started to, you know, that's where we're learning the learning. We don't learn from people who do well. We learn from people who mm -hmm. do poorly. And so the harder they are, the more we're learning. And uh, we know that, for instance, binge eating is a, is a horrible disease. And we're able to have, ha we're able to help probably over half of our binge eaters lose weight here. It's the only center in, that I know in the world that's doing that today. Um, the other half, we're still trying to get, we, they don't gain any weight. They may not be losing much. They may only lose 20, 30 pounds and they, they need to lose 100. But at least they're getting control and they're settling down to where they are. And we begin to, to look into why they go off and eat four or 5,000 calories in a sitting. And they have to learn from that. So we, we have a totally different program for that. Mindful eating, which you probably are aware of. So we teach mindful eating. And we have special, uh, and so the groups are specially done for people who have binge eating. So they're all binge eaters sitting in the groups. So they begin to understand each other and they realize I'm not the only one that does this. And so from that, now some of those people um, I will ask the psychologist, can we do get any better? And I said, Dr. D. Domenico, if I see him every week for the next 20 years, I can get him 5% better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it goes way back so deep. It takes psychoanalysis to get there. <clears throat> but at least we got him settled down and we got him going where we got. That binge eaters represents about 15 to 20% of all people who are overweight. And then normally the really heavy, the, the morbidly obese person is a binge eater. Um, so that's the only difficult group we have that we're not doing well with. Uh, and we do well, better than yeah. everybody else. But well, and on the positive side too, 2020 Lifestyles measures success beyond just a scale, mm -hmm. which is yep. really empowering to the patient because if it was just based on the scale, how frustrating is that if one week you improved all your eating habits, you were at the gym three days a week, you feel better about yourself, but you step on the scale and nothing happens. And so we put in place, you know, various measures of success from emotional traits to positive thinking. Did you change how you interact with your family? How does your kitchen pantry look like now? How do you feel? How do you self-talk? Do you see an improvement? 
And when you have these different parameters or measures of success, your patient feels really good beyond just basing success on that narrow approach of the scale. And I think that's been some, really nice how we do this. Some people will lose 1% uh, of their body weight a, um, a week and others up to 2%, two and a half. And it depends and <clears throat> has something to do with brown fat cells and we don't fully understand how they get these brown fat cells and so forth and so on. So, you know, men have always been faster losers than women. They probably have more brown fat cells than women. Uh, but we have some women that can lose four pounds a week and just that thing keeps going like that week after week after week. For the most part, if the, uh, we get most people back to a, close to a normal body mass index uh, before they leave here. Mm -hmm. If they if they come in for the right amount of time, and each and it depends on how long they'll be here, depending on how much they weigh and how much they have to lose, because I only do one or two percent a week. I'm not Jesus, and right. I thought I was for a while, but I'm not. Okay, so just teasing. <coughs> um, our success rate is pretty good, and the only ones I I really is, are still, as you can tell, I'm worried about are the binge eating and that small group that just kind of flattens out and doesn't do anything. Um, we're still working on that. And we're going to find the answer for it, and we've got we've got good psychologists, and it's really a psychologist problem because there's something deep yeah. seated in that person. Yeah. We're also about to start a whole thing of doing uh, genomes on everybody here that we've had and patients that we've had <laughs> ten years ago. We're going to do their genomes, and then we'll put their genomes together with what's happened in their environment, and we're going to get an idea to say, pretty soon be able to say, this person's genomes means is going to mean this is going to happen during their weight loss. Mm, yeah, the gene environment interaction. Since we have a 20 year history okay. to go through and we have all the patients still listed and so yeah. we can go back and look and what, ha what has happened to that patient for the last ever, how long they've been out of the program, what happened to them before and then now we know what their genomes are and then we can start to study from there. So we'll see what's happening with the genomes and then we'll see what the environment did to it. Uh, or maybe, you know, this person's going to lose slower, this person's going to lose faster. This person needs to work at a heart rate that's lower than we normally would think. Now we have a way of doing that now. We, we figure we can tell exactly when a person burns fat and when they go off to burning sugar, okay? And we want, them burning, we want to keep their heart rate at the point where they're burning fat. Well, we used to have a, you know, you took 220 and do their annual. Well, that doesn't work as well with everybody. And sometimes when we, when we either slow them down or speed them up, their weight loss will go like much steeper. Interesting. So again, we're, we're learning from this stuff and it's, it's just, we're learning from our patients as we go. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we're working with some guys in the, in the genome area, so it's, uh, we should have some answers um, in the next couple of years. If we could go back to the binge eating aspect, what, uh, like grabbing the low hanging fruit, because I do get this question a lot about food cravings and binging and things like that. You know, there was a, a study that came out that showed that Vietnam vets, everyone was worried that they would be addicted to heroin because when they're in Vietnam, they're on heroin, but then when they're in a new environment, the heroin addiction went away and that's like a strong chemical dependency. So. You talk about this in the book a little bit, like changing up the environment mm -hmm. and changing how you speak to yourself. If you could, what are some of the, the like two or three tips for people that do have these binges, these cravings that you could offer for them? I would say that the areas that we work with is visualization, uh, visualizing yourself in a better place, how to deal with the situation that is your trigger. I would also say that identifying those foods that are your trigger foods, and they're usually sweet, salty combinations of fatty Sugar foods. Fat and salt. Yeah. And, and then another area that we really emphasize is who you surround yourself with. Um, you know, do you have supporters that are your spouse, your family members, your friends? Do they want to keep you unsuccessful at dieting, or do they really want to support you? And there's more. These are just some of the tips. That's that a very common thing, keeping you yes. unsuccessful. We found that it's interesting, but we did find that, that sometimes um, a spouse would really like for their partner to not be successful because maybe they themselves are having some issues and so they want a partner in their misery. And when we see you know, the individual succeeding, feeling better about themselves, that changes the environment. 
and that has been a whole other issue to deal with, which is off topic of yeah, what you asked us, but well, we do we recognize We have couples that. come in here that weigh uh, 300 pounds, both of them. So they know yeah. what they're doing every night, they're eating, you know, and uh, so uh, if they both don't get involved, guess what? Mm -hmm. The spouse yeah. of that person is going to try to dig the sand out from underneath their feet because, and I've actually had patients where the, the husband or the wife brought home pizzas and dropped them on the table and said, give this thing up, let's go. Mm -hmm. We're done with this stupidity. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, because they didn't want this to happen. So that could actually, you know, be another strategy that we deal with with binging and emotional eating is that many times it's a result of you know, fi family dynamics and personal So we try, to, we try to draw the family in from the very yeah. beginning and we say, we need spousal support. Right. And uh, you, need to, you need to get, and we have a video that they need to see before the person can come in the program that talks to the family and talks not only to the husband or wife, it talks to the kids yeah. and says, you know what? If you don't support this person, they're not gonna be successful. And they're doing this because they love you. So here's the first place we begin to interject loving people and loving each other. I mean, mom isn't trying to lose all this weight with these and has five kids uh, not because she wants to see these kids all graduate from college. Mm -hmm. She wants to be around for them and uh, they need to understand that. And so, you know, the kids got to, the kids will actually will pick up the banner faster than the spouse sometimes. They will help mom faster their, or dad, whoever's in the program. Uh, quicker than the than than the spouse, but the mm -hmm. spouse eventually will do it. Yeah, I think physiologically too, we spend a lot of time talking about the importance of sleep and reducing stress because we know that when you're sleep deprived and stressed, it changes your hormone levels like cortisol, but it also drives that seeking for food, um, especially when you look at the appetite hormones and the balance between them. So lifestyle is really critical. You know, sleep and, I would say sleep and stress are, are right at the top of our, you know, of our list of when we work with our patients. Yeah, it was, when I was reading through the book, that was what I love so much about it, is you're bringing in the mindset and the mm -hmm. habits and so forth with the biochemistry like you're talking about, yes. sleep and mindset. And one thing that I noticed is just becoming more aware and being having more self-compassion. That's not often talked a lot about in the diet books. No. It's like, here's this hack, here's this tip, take this pre-workout supplement, yes. then go do these intervals, and everyone's trying to hack and circumvent, but I like how you're just saying, okay, I'm, I ha I'm having a craving right now. It was a stressful day. Just being yes. aware and cognizant of that can actually be progressing. So mm -hmm. do you want to speak to that a little bit? That's the premise of the book. Yeah. Um, you know, as we've been talking about, and what we find with our patients, how we came to this title is, so many of our patients have failed at diets. Um, they have tried just about every diet that's out there. They are professional dieters. But with that comes a very high level of stress, distrust in diets, lack of love for themselves because they feel this shame and guilt that they're not able to lose the weight. And so once we break this shame cycle we start to really get them closer to what we find are the, the pivotal of this program is self, you know, acceptance, self-respect, self-love, which eventually le leads to respecting your body. And so we break it into those tiers and exactly our psychologist is wonderful at creating that because it's hard to say, well, you need to love yourself. That's what we're all about, just love yourself. And, but to get there, you really have to break it and go through these stages. And, and I would say that's really the premise of the book of 2020 Lifestyles and the style of how we work with our patients. Well, you know, it's, if you can just get them to respect themselves, and then you tell them, I think I told you earlier, just say to them, pretend you love yourself. Mm -hmm. Pretend you love yes. yourself. And do everything you do for the next two weeks pretending you love yourself. And uh, all of a sudden you find out one morning you do love yourself. And it's a wonderful feeling for them. Yeah. And uh, because they've they felt like they're such failures, that they're a failure in life. And it can go the other way around. A girl can put on a lot of weight and suddenly she just feels like this is, her life is just gonna be nothing for the rest yeah. of her life. I'm, I'm trapped in this thing, I'm, I can't get out. 
I'm stuck here. And I hate it, and I hate myself. Right. Now, they're in real trouble. And the way to quit the hate, eat. Mm -hmm. And especially eating reward center foods. Things with a lot of sugar, fat, and salt in it, whether it's candy or, you know, what it is. It can be crackers, it can be, you know, it can be pretzels, it can be potato chips, it can be french fries, going to McDonald's. That'll all make them feel better, but only as long as they're eating it. So then it's this vicious cycle that spirals out of control. And it's going. Yes, it does. So the self-love, I like that. Just pretend that you love yourself. Act That's as really if cool. is what we say. Pretend you love yourself. Yeah. yeah, act as if you love yeah. yourself. Act like you love yourself. Act as if, you know, you like to exercise and you're slim and you're positive and you're grateful. We yeah. do a lot of that. All and of a sudden they do. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, I love. Another part that you talk about in the book is like tracking things. So what you mm -hmm. can, if you don't track and measure, you can oh, yeah. improve upon it. So what are some of the high hit rate tracking tools and modalities that you like? I know you love your pedometer and things. Can you sure. On it? Well, we put a pedometer on everybody mm -hmm. because what will happen is <clears throat> if you're if your body is losing weight and it thinks its set point should be 250 and you're trying to get to 180, right? As you get to 240, 230, your body says, whoa, whoa, I'm in an area where there's no food. Therefore, I should cut my steps down. I should cut down any activity that burns calories. This body's pretty smart. It, it thinks you're in an area where there's no food. It's like an animal in, in, li living in the forest and, and there's no food around and I'm losing weight. So the animals will lay down. They won't move much. So we try to lay down in the same way. So when you drive down to Albertsons to go to the grocery store, instead of parking in the stall six w away from the door, you try to park in the lobby. And you don't even know you're doing it. Instead of ever t uh, taking stairs, you take the elevator. And pretty soon your steps go from five or 6,000 a day down to 2,000. Now, how much exercise is gone? Maybe that will offset the exercise you did in the morning. And we actually had a group of women come through here in the very beginning, that's how we learned this, was that they weren't losing any weight and they were swearing they were eating right, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. why, 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 why? So I finally started to ask them some, we got them in a focus group and asked them, what do you used to do? Well, I used to do the housework, do you do it anymore? No, I have somebody come in, why? Well, I exercise in the morning. Well, what else did you used to do? Well, I used to do this and that or whatever, something else in the house. Okay, well, do you do that anymore? No, I don't do that anymore. I have somebody come in and do that now. I used to work out in the garden. Do you work out in the garden anymore? No, I have a gardener come. Why do you have a gardener come? Because, well, I'm working out in the morning. And what mm -hmm. they were doing in the morning, they were coming home and sitting all the rest of the day, no steps, no nothing. They were down, actually some of those girls were down to 1,500 steps and put a pedometer on them. Wow. When we got them back to 5,000 steps, their weight started to come off again. Yeah. People really underestimate like how much energy expenditure you do when you garden or get grocery. Yeah, stay house. active. Mm -hmm. That's a huge point. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. And from a dietary standpoint, we use we have a wonderful website that allows you to track your meals, and so they can track everything that they're eating. The dietitian supervises is available to support them. You know, we know through studies from Kelly Brownell that people who plan and track are more successful. So there's no denying that that when you write something down, you're mindful, you're aware of what you're consuming, and you have a plan to match it to. We also use the plate concept so that when they're eating from a plate, because some of our patients probably eat out of a bag or out of a package while they're on the computer. So we say, you know, eat from a plate. We give them guidelines on how to plate their food. And so that's just another way to also be mindful and to track what you're eating. So it, it's not only from physical activity, but also from a caloric standpoint, as well as from the content or the type of calories that they're consuming. Because they do have a diet that's very specific to guide them for food groups and types of choices that they eat through a weekly basis. So I would say that, you know, there's a lot of tools to help them track their success and, and keep them aware. A nine inch plate. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Yes. Uh, what was the science on that? I was curious. I remember that in the book. Well, we went to 14-inch plates yeah. because we just wanted more food on our plates. More veggies. Yeah. <laughs> no, we didn't want more veggies. No, we didn't. But the but the world or went to 14-inch yes. plates, and and it got bigger. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, Nine-inch plate is is the right size the, of plate. The old-fashioned dinner plate. Okay. So if you go to a garage sale and and you're into antiques and you want to buy a, a beautiful set of china from 
you know, probably the 1960s, a dinner plate is about nine inches. Where if you compare it to a dinner plate today, it's, as Mark said, 14, 14 16, 16, inches. 16. And the bigger the plate, we know from studies, the more food that you can put on, you're going to eat. Which means That's I love that. you more in yes. Italian. <laughs> yeah. yes, the palm of your hand, for instance, is six ounces, and it's the right thickness of chicken or meat or fish or whatever. So it's real simple. It doesn't take a big 14-inch plate to put the palm of your hand on. But then you have a, a section that's for vegetables and, and uh, salads and that. And then you have a section for carbohydrates, one carbohydrate. So you can have half a cup of fruit or you can have a glass of milk, but not a half a cup of fruit and a glass of milk. Or you can have one serving of beans, which is about a half a cup. You know, if you went to Xtapa, you would get one serving, you would get 20 servings of beans <laughs> and they're all done in lard, right? Okay. Or you can get one serving of, of grains, which is like a piece of toast uh, or with your breakfast in the morning. That's a serving. But you can't have a piece of toast and the fruit. Or if you drink, the, the wine becomes your serving of carbohydrate. Yeah, now we keep now you keep them away from the sugar that sets their brain off to going. I want more. I want more. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of the reasons people drink or, and eat more at, when they eat out is that they're getting a glass of wine before they ever start dinner, and the wine has a lot of sugar in it, and the sugar sets their brain off, and now they order everything on the menu plus dessert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all the inhibitions are gone. Oh, all, sure. And the inhibitions all of a sudden go away it's okay. at the same time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Manana. Right. Manana. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, like I said, I really enjoyed the book. There's so many transformative aspects. And just even if people are not struggling with weight loss but want to improve something in their life, we often forget about the self-love and self-respect and just yes. being mindful of the things that we say about ourselves and how mm -hmm. we present ourselves to the world is really transformative. So, um, How we, we present ourselves to ourselves. Yes, that's a very good way of saying it. Remember to present yourself to yourself the same way yeah. you want to present yourself to the that's world. That's great. Right. And a lot of people don't believe what they're saying about themselves, unfortunately, in this world. Because as we talked about, there's not enough love passed around in this, in this world today. And so it's always, I can do that better, I can do that better, you can do that better, you can do that better, instead of, great job, I love you for that. This is wonderful. Nobody says that. Yeah, we need that. I need it. I walk around here and get a lot of love from all my employees every day. Oh, the patients love him. That's fantastic. <laughs> Makes them feel great. You know, I think that that's also what's very unique is that you have a physician that truly loves his patients. And I don't know as if you can say that for so many physicians and the way medicine is going nowadays, but you'll walk by the hallway and I'll be behind him or walking with Dr. Mark and he'll say, good morning. I love you. How You look great. And you look at the reaction of that patient and they're still smiling as they walk away. That has to be important. And I think that that's really also very unique. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, as we wrap up, guys, any uh, final thoughts or things that we didn't get to talk about on the book that you'd like to share before we part ways? You know, I'd like to say that, you know, I often get asked this question, you know, how did you think of writing this book with Dr. Mark? and? What is this book about? And what really um, makes me so proud is not only writing it with my mentor, Dr. Mark, but to be able to reflect back and write about wisdom along with medical practice. I think there's a lot of great doctors, a lot of wonderful dietitians, and very many good diets that are out there, but I don't know of any that can really reflect on wisdom that is something that is intangible to the success of a diet. Um, there's a lot of great diets out there, but we have to be realistic. 98% of them fail. And so I would really like to say that we've created something that is going to make a difference for a patient that is based on a lot, a lot of years of success, failure, and wisdom. Yep. That's good. <laughs> He's great. That's good. That, that's what we do here. I yes. Mean, uh, this is all about the patients here, mm -hmm. and um, without the patients, we're nobody. Yeah. I mean, well, 
interesting to kind of second what you were saying there, Dr. Connie, is these anecdotes and these small stories, you know, that are often brushed aside in traditional medicine as yes. not statistically significant. How many patients reported that, you know? And so what we're seeing now in functional medicine is practitioners are being encouraged to listen to the patient, what their need and need, what that patient is telling them, yeah. these anecdotes and these stories, and to, you know, hold value in that. So you noticed. That you're, you're really yes, you noticed. And we talked about this and we said, you know, let's write this book from the patient's perspective and their voice because I think they're tired of hearing us lecturing and lecturing. And we really allowed these very special individuals to tell their story so that when a reader picks up this book and says, you know, that's me, I really understand Donna, or I, I kind of see myself in Kim. And it's different when they have this connection with the patient and the story to say that they find themselves in this situation and then we can just support the knowledge. So we did write it in a different um, style and the publisher was really interested in that and they said, we like this. It's a different voice and, and it's a lot easier to connect for the reader. The publisher was wonderful to us. Yes. Yeah. It was really wonderful to us and uh, um, it just doesn't happen very often. Mm -mm. Um, I guess this is a book of that uh, has been coming for about 20 years. It finally got here. <laughs> we worked very hard. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot to put it Yes, it, it does. So uh, I think it, if we can help people get started, and the first get started is like yourself. If we can just get people to like themselves, we're halfway home to making them well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that doesn't matter what's making them sick whether it's their weight or their cholesterol or hypertension or their diabetes, if they start liking themselves, they're halfway home to making themselves well, yeah, I think. Well put. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it's important to like yourself. One quite we have a couple of set of questions that are a little bit more casual, kind of informal yes. as we end the show here. We know that successful people generally have a morning routine. Uh, we could start with you, Connie. What's your morning routine? Do you have a, a set of things you like to do every morning? To I do. I love to have breakfast. I like to visit with the kids during breakfast. And something that's recently stopped is I used to like to drive them to school. And then I go to the gym and I have a little bit of time for myself. So I would say that's about my morning. My morning is breakfast and into the gym. And I, I call it MBWA. You know what MBWA stands for? <laughs> Management by walking around. So I go oh, through I this like place that. and I get a feel for what's going on with everybody. I see my patients down there on the floor. They see me. They say, well, he can do it. I can do it, and uh, um, and I also get a feel for what's going on in the whole building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good for you. That sounds great. I like that. And if there was one herb, nutrient, or botanical you just couldn't live without, maybe it's ashwagandha, maybe it's blueberries. Ooh. What would that be, Connie, and why? Let me think. You know, I like a cup of tea mm -hmm. in the afternoon, in the evening, and it sets my routine, and it's. I, I'm really busy and I'm also very energetic, but it gets me to slow down and think a few minutes in the afternoon and then in the evening just to relax a little bit and pull my thoughts. I'm a planner, so pull my thoughts for the next day. So I, I don't really take a lot of botanicals or herbs, but maybe a tea would, I would say probably that. It's because it's part of a ritual and a routine. Good habit. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, with me, uh for the last 50 years, I've been giving my patients omega-3 fatty acids. Oh. I believe they're the fountain of youth. I think they're anti-inflammatory. I think we get way too much omega-6, and we need to balance mm -hmm. up with omega-3s, and they're the omega-3s. And so I started in 1968 giving my patients omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I also started that same, the next year, giving them all 31, uh, 81 milligrams of aspirin. Um, because of the prostaglandins and different things. And um, there's been a lot of controversy. They said I was crazy back then, but now I'm not look so crazy anymore. So I think there's certain things that, that this body needs. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I think we're getting, and there's certain things we're getting too much of, but it's all right, we can balance it out. Uh, and such as omega-6s, we can balance it out with omega-3s. Um, I think we need to control the sugar in people's diets because we don't need to have Alzheimer's and all these diseases that are going to come with it eventually. And um, so I, 
But that's taking something away, not taking something in. Um, <laughs> you only get three. I don't. I take. Uh, I take a vitamin every morning. I take my omega threes every morning. I take some. Uh, I don't go out in the sun, so I take some some D vitamin D in the morning. And there's certain things I take. And in this building, we also have a major anti-aging program. And uh, so I've been on hormones for 35 years. Uh, I plan on staying on it as long, if I can get another 15 years out of my life, I'll be a happy guy. But I feel pretty good, you know, you know and, I, and uh, I, I come to work every day, it's what I love to do. And uh, you know, I'm 78 years old now, so you know, everybody tells me I should be retiring, I said, I'm just getting started. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> That's, That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm having a good time. I, and I would not miss giving the introductory lecture, which is two and a half hour seminar. In 24 years, if I was in Germany on a Monday night, they have me here on Thursday night for that. I have not missed it in 24 mm -hmm. years. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because I, I think it's important. I think it's one of the most important research projects I've been involved in. I've been involved in a lot. Uh, we're doing stem cells and we're doing stuff in, a, in another area across the street. Um, but this is this area is just overwhelming to me. That what we have to do in it. I mean, it's the toughest disease I've ever dealt with is obesity and the metabolic diseases. Um, normally we can find answers to things. This one we're finding answers, but they're slow to, to drag out onto, you know, to get them out, but we're gonna get there. And uh, as I say, the bowel bacteria is gonna be a big deal coming down the route. And while we're learning about bowel bacteria, we'll learn a lot of other stuff too. Mm -hmm. So I think we're doing good. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. You know, a lot of people just look forward to retirement. And what I heard right there is you. Uh -uh. He's not retiring. Purpose, you don't want to retire, which I really love. <laughs> no. so it I always work. take my homework home with me. Yes, around. he does. Good for you. If I don't have homework going home, they, they, they would look at me around here oh. like I was crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's fantastic. So uh, last question here. If you were to bump shoulders with the uh, president of the United States or someone from the World Health Organization just had an elevator pitch, you know, 30 seconds to share with them just one health tip, one lifestyle tip, what would you tell them, Connie, and why? I would tell them treat your body like it's somebody you love. And that encompasses really everything that we try to do here. We find ourselves taking care of everybody else and then ourselves last. And I think that has to change a little bit. We were just talking about that at lunch today, how parents are going over and beyond with their kids to make sure that they have access to everything and taking, doing everything but maybe not taking care of ourselves. And it's not a selfish thing to treat yourself with respect and love. I'll second that because, you know, if we don't love ourselves, we're in real trouble. And, it, you know, we're busy making our kids better at baseball, basketball, yeah. hockey, whatever it is. And then we stop long enough to tell them we love them. That's important, too, and to give them the self-esteem. They need. Now, they're trying to get them self-esteem in their sport. But what if they're not the best? It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> And somebody needs to tell them it's okay and put their arm around them and say, it's all right, I'll still love you. You're the greatest, you know. You don't have to be the best. And so we need to take care of each other. And we need in this country to start looking out after each other. Mm -hmm. right. If you walk through this building, you will see a thousand employees that are all looking out after each other. You will be amazed by what you will see in this building. Yeah, okay. And we always say that we just can't wait to get through the door and have it closed behind us because this is a safe place for all of us. Very important. Yeah, very important to us. A safe place to be. Uh, everybody loves each other and looks out for each other. Yeah. Well, I kind of keep her around. Right. She's my first dietitian. She's yeah. the best. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, I really commend you for the book, Love Diet. Thank you. Dr. Connie Gunnarsson, Dr. Mark De Dominico. thank you for all the great work. Thanks for this interview. If folks want to reach out and learn more about 2020 Lifestyle Program or the Love Diet, where would you want them to go? We have a website. We have a website, 2020lifestyles.com. And we have um, also the Pro Sports Club has a website. And I have a website under my name, cool. for ConnieGutterson.com. Fantastic. Well, again, really appreciate your, the opportunity to sit with you guys knee to knee and enjoy reading the book as well. Oh, so. thank you. Oh, well, we enjoy sitting with you, Michael. Yeah.